do not know. I think I'm probably the most transparent person in public life. Um, I feel you know a lot more about me than you know about anybody else. I think I'm probably the most transparent person in public life. We are back here, the Meet and Potato Show, Conservative Talk, and Awesome Rock on KTMTRadio.com. My good friend Ted Busiak, we've taken care of business here, and uh, I want to thank Ted for staying. Thanks, Ted. Thanks a lot. Hey, no problem. Anytime. Thank you so much for having me. Anytime. Anytime. More than welcome. Um, we're, we're here. So there we go with that. Yeah. With uh, Again, we're talking out of two sides of our mouths here, and Comey had said that in his, when the first when the first announcement was made that she wasn't going to be indicted or even prosecuted, you know, he went on to say that you know that's not to say that anybody else caught doing this isn't going to be punished with the full extent of the law. And essentially, as I heard on Rush Limbaugh, that um, you know we're we're looking at a double standard here. We're looking at two sets of laws for two different classes of people. Go ahead. I yeah. I mean, I I feel like uh, that's it's a top to bottom phenomenon. Um, it's codified, it's legally codified increasingly that there are two sets of laws for different ca classes or even castes, you might say, of people. But where it isn't legally codified, and, and where it is, that's deplorable. But where it isn't, you can, you can bet that the left will just take it upon themselves to act as though it was. And sure enough, that's how it will work out. For a lady like Hillary Clinton, for an establishment queen like mm -hmm. Hillary Clinton, there's no... You know, there's no, uh, there's no repercussions for breaking the law. There's no repercussions for, there's, why, why should there be though? Why should there, there was no, there were no real repercussions for the, uh, the cattle futures shenanigans, there were no repercussions for Whitewater, there were no repercussions for, uh, for, Rose there's law no, firm. The, for Rose Law Firm, there's no repercussions the for Arkansas. The there's right. no repercussion. Yeah, Arkansas. I like that. Yeah, that's, that's what it was. That's the darkest one of all. I mean, have you seen? You know, so many people. Now I sound like one of those black helicopter people. You know, like uh, Chris. Did you see where I put my tinfoil hat? I'm worried about the, you know, the hey, rays. No, the I rays usually mind keep control tinfoil is. in here. Right. Um, wrap right. it around the building. However, it is pretty remarkable how many people who are associated with the Clintons or affiliated with the Clintons end up dead. There's some other report, I know, unexpected. There's another report circulating around social media that somebody who was going to talk about the, uh, the DNC scandal has suddenly himself wound up dead. Now, I, I can't check the validity of it right now. I'm not sure how valid it is, but right. here we go again. This involves, right, I believe this involves a 27-year-old DNC staffer named Seth. I forget his last name, but yeah, strange. Another death in strange circ with strange circumstances, which makes you know the 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 sixtieth or something connected to the Clintons. I mean, we're talking serial killer level here. <laughs> some at some point, and again, I don't want to be one of these tinfoil hat. You know, the fluoride in our water is uh, is is. <laughs> no, but I mean, <laughs> but but it's, it's but it's getting a little too coincidental. Right, yeah, there. yeah there, at some point. One or two times. All right, it's a coincidence. Right. Yeah. At some point, it strains credulity. You know, <laughs> oh, these man. people are. I mean, just ask any Bernie Sanders supporter, and they'll tell you these people are ruthless, cutthroat mobsters. That's a fact. You're not getting any pushback from, like, no one's giving you crap about your campaign or, I mean, I know they're giving you crap in the media and they're saying you should pull out and that you're not welcome here, but I mean, you're not getting any... Oh, can we get that article up? Could you, do you have that on your phone? I want to get that article. Yeah, let me get that article. I want to have a little fun with this. But what was your question, Chris? Uh, what, are you getting any, like, anybody getting on your case, like, I'm gonna. I want to use the word threaten, but I don't mean threaten you like threatening your life, but just really. Oh, I get. I get threats to my life. I've I've gotten death threats. I've got, I've gotten stuff that I've reported to the police. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. The left are not uh, are not pleasant people. Um, but what were you gonna ask about? What were you That's what ask? I was asking you. Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think it comes with the territory. I'm not. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm not going to run away and hide or wilt like a you know like a little flower. I, I kind of figured that even before I ran, I kind of figured like okay, I'm kind of a I'm kind of an out of the box guy. So yeah, I put myself out there, right? I you know I kind of figured that you know it comes with the territory that you it, you know you get the attention of some lunatics as well. I would say this though for every uh, for every person who sends 
a nasty gram or a death threat or an email telling me to you know suck a dick or something. Right. There's there's probably two or three people who reach out and say, I'm so glad that you are not that you are standing up for us. I'm so glad that you are refusing to apologize. In fact, to these I think it was I think it was the last time Ted was here in July. My audience will remember that somebody did. Somebody called in after you had left, and I had gotten into the entertainment portion of the show. Somebody called in, and that's what they said. They, they, they were saying, they were saying, I hear you like to suck dick, and they're going on and on. And so I'm like, yeah, man, I can like suck a golf ball through a garden hose, man. What this is the, uh, yeah, this is the elevated discourse of the left that they're always preening on. You know, they're always going on and on about their elevated discourse. That's what it is. Um, so this is uh, BostonHerald.com. Um, From the Herald, really? Yeah, well, the Herald's the Herald's got the Herald's got its its share of uh, fifth columnists, right? Um, Senate press on candidate who used slur. Stay away. This is quotes. Stay away. We don't want you. So I was I was wrong. I should never have uh, I should never have said it was DeLeo. All right, that's uh, it. it. Was, Devin's had enough. It was Stan <laughs> Rosenberg. Yeah, Devin's Devin's over here in his cups. Jesus. <laughs> Every time, I, every time I go on air, you know, he gets so nervous about the next crazy thing I'm going to say that he has to drink in order to keep. Well, that's why I've given him beer. <laughs> right. So this is by uh, this is by um, I'm going to call out the person who wrote this, Jordan Graham. Um, and I'll just go through the article. Massachusetts Senate President Stanley Rosenberg today lambasted a Republican candidate for state Senate for using a homophobic slur. Oh, God. Here's the quote. The Senate and the legislature in general would not benefit by having a person with that kind of mentality and approach in our midst, Rosenberg said of candidate Ted Music, that's me, uh, in an interview this morning on Boston Herald Radio. If you want me to be clearer, stay away. We don't want you. Oh, this is the wrong article because this isn't the one where they're like, his future boss doesn't even want him here. This is a different article. I guess that, I guess because he said made these idiotic comments, a couple of people wrote articles about him. But there was another article that was even better than this. I mean, Vinny, if you can find it, look for one where they're talking about, like maybe do a Google search where you do that, but include like his boss in quotes, because there's, uh, there's one where they, 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 they betray a complete lack of understanding of how Beacon Hill even works. Like they, they think that I'm gonna get fired by Stan Rosenberg, if I get a list. <laughs> and, I, and I wouldn't doubt it if a lot of the people, a lot of the voters out there would probably just completely agree. Yes, he would have to be fired. I mean, well, I'm sorry, it's called an impeachment process. It's a very long process. It takes a long time, and a lot of time. We're already it talking about work. impeaching me? Wait, wait, wait. We're already talking about that, Chris. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. High crimes and misdemeanors. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I haven't even gotten elected. Let's save the impeachment talk for at least like day two. Well, let's talk about your elect. Let's talk about your campaign now. Uh, let's. Uh, you're obviously meeting a lot of people. Yep. Um, what What are your numbers looking Wouldn't be like? Boss. Oh, there you go. Oh, here we go. All right, let me. This is it. I see. I knew Jacqueline Cashman, right? Uh, who I knew it was. I knew it was a lady who wrote it, and she's actually a columnist. So here's what she writes: Cashman. No Beacon Hill welcome mat for GOP slur slinger. That sounds like a, that's, that sounds like I'm auditioning for the Fantastic Four. Invisible girl, human torch, slur slinger. That's me. Um, Ted Busick, a Republican running against State Senator Jamie Eldridge, should stop wasting time campaigning for the job because, frankly. He is not welcome on Beacon Hill. Oh, I'm sorry, Jacqueline Cashman. I didn't know that you could only run for office if, you, if the establishment wants you there. Oh, I'm sorry. The, uh, the purveyors of this sick, corrupted status quo don't want you, so uh, just don't even bother wasting your time, because they don't even like you. You're not welcome there. I'm sorry, you're not welcome at our little exclusive club. Busick sent out an extremely offensive tweet over the weekend using a homophobic slur. This is a little old. So what was the slur? The sl I called a uh, congressman a faggot. Oh, that's right. I this is a little dated. I've been in. This is like this is like two controversies ago. I've already. I've sent many you offensive read, tweets. You've read yeah, the I've sent many order. offensive tweets <laughs> since then. Yeah. <laughs> I like this article. <laughs> you, so. Um, Yesterday, his would-be boss, this is, this is what she's writing, this is how little this woman understands civics. And yesterday, his would-be boss, State President Stanley C. Rosenberg, 
who's gay. Oh, I'm glad. What, did you get some good news? I'm glad. I, I, I'm pretty gay myself, hanging out with my buddy Oh, Chris. really? Um, it's a gay affair here. It is, yeah. Uh, told me on Boston Herald Radio that the Littleton politician should apply for another job. I'm not applying to fucking Stan Rosenberg, you dunce! <laughs> He's running for state senate. I'm running for office. They can vote for me. The only application for process is filing the paperwork. In fact, Stan Rosenberg can't vote for me. He couldn't vote against me if he wanted to. So he's the last person you should be asking. Do a poll. Maybe I'm totally anachronistic and everybody hates me, but that's... The only thing that matters here, not what Stan Rosenberg thinks. It's amazing to me that she th believes that like working, being a state senator is like a job that you apply to with a state senate president, and then if he doesn't like you, he's gonna fire you. It's just so weird. How out of touch are these people? It doesn't surprise me anymore. It really doesn't surprise me anymore with the amount of people and the the, the level of intelligence, not only in our media. I mean, just people in general. You had said that you have a lot of young people coming and working for your campaign, but then there's a lot of other young people. A lot of them leftists. It's really... It's it's sad. Well, why do you think my opponent is so vehemently opposed to charter schools? Jamie Eldridge, my Democratic opponent, is, uh, you know, is a campaigning champion for... Um, for the local school boards and teachers unions. He hates charter schools yeah. with a, you know, he's a- uh, big common core yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah, he just retweeted, he just retweeted a call for a national moratorium on charter schools. A national moratorium on charter schools. It's like I pointed out in the debate, uh, US News and World Report ranks the top Massachusetts schools. Guess what? Two of the top three are charter schools. Are charter schools. And the other one is an exam school. A so moratorium that, on charter right, schools, a right. moratorium on people deciding for themselves. Exactly, and getting their kids into a better school where they're not going to be indoctrinated by leftists and... and Being able to make the choice. Right. No, only women are allowed to make the choice. Right, that's right. Choices for choices for our special groups. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Again, so, they're cho talking two sides of the mouth. Choice is a great word, except when it isn't. All animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. What else? <laughs> exactly. Well, well, again, talk, talking out of two sides of their mouth, and they, and they get away with this. I, but I mentioned about young people, and it, that you've got some young people uh, working on your campaign, and that right. you meet a lot of them. Right. <clears throat> what do you hear them say? What? Why are they getting involved in the campaign? Oh, man, what do I hear them say? Okay, for one thing, uh, Jay Eldridge, uh, Jacqueline Cashman, all you guys, if you think what I'm saying is bad, you would faint if you heard what the young people who are helping me out say in, front, in, in their you casual conversation. It, right? Yeah, yeah, you would, we would need to revive you with smelling salts, you'd be gone. Um, but yeah, I mean, they're, um, they're a little... They must be excited, enthused, and... Right, yeah, it's exactly what you would think, they're less... They're less jaded and less cynical than even me, and I don't consider myself too jaded or cynical. But these are like super idealistic, you know, people. Uh, you know, a lot of them are um, maybe not that um, connected or into, into politics. Uh, we've had to register some people to vote because um, they weren't even registered. But they're, you know, they're. They're interested, I guess, just in the fact that there's somebody running who's. Um, different and they you know they can see the writing on the wall look when your generation i mean not to you're a, a few years older than me but when it, it, even when our parents were graduating high school going to college you could fund your college education on a summer job at you know washing sure. dishes or sure. something right um i i i, I remember watching a, like a c-span program from the 1980s where they're interviewing high school students. This is in like 1988. And high school students are like, yeah, I'm graduating from high school and so far I've gotten job offers from this company and this company and this company in my local community and this factory wants me to come work there and these people want... And that doesn't like, exist now. Yeah, it, never, that's, it was so alien to me like to watch that to really realize how much better off people were in the Reagan years than they are now. So young people are the ones I think who have the most to lose. You know, the the the, hip, the burned out hippie baby boomers who tend to be, you know, Democrat voters in this state don't really have anything to lose anymore, 
right? Because they tend to be, I mean, they're not particularly fecund people, they're not ex exceptionally fertile, mm -hmm. so it's not like they even have a posterity to worry about. Usually they have like an only child and their only child had no children of their own. You know, it's a very, it's a dying breed. The, the Massachusetts burned out hippie leftist is a dying breed. I would agree with that. That's um, probably why they have to get to get involved in things like uh, the, the gay coalition and exactly, uh, yeah. oh, get involved yeah. with Black Lives Matter. You know, they have to they have to cultivate. That's an interesting point you make. And it's one of the things I had talked about a long time ago on the Vice Show, is that the left constantly has to cultivate. All these leftist groups constantly have to cultivate and try to bring people in. The right doesn't have to do that. Something about becoming a, a right-thinking person, and I mean that in both definitions, right meaning political and right meaning you're right, you're correct, right. is that this comes through time. I myself, I've said this on my show, when I was 17, 18, I was a Kennedy liberal, I was raised in that Ted Kennedy household in Massachusetts, my mother, the whole nine yards. All of this came about over the last, I'd say, 30 years or so in my lifetime. And it only came about because I started working, started running businesses, started having to deal with everything else out there in society, paying my taxes, dealing with regulations and everything else. And as time went on, I, it just got worse and worse, and I just kept watching it, paying more and more attention to politics and watching it all slide downhill. And to a certain degree, I had to deal with that, oh, you're a neocon. You know, when you first start turning to the dark side, as I call it, the dark side, the right. Republican side, is that, that you tend to get labeled as a neocon because you just came into the fold. Well, now we're talking 30 years now. So that neocon label is gone on me. And it's something that comes naturally to people who want to join the Republican side or the right side or the conservative side. But the left constantly has to cultivate. Constantly, constantly young people. They're too young and they're too dumb to understand their history. I'm 53. I remember Nixon. I was a little kid when Johnson, I was just a toddler and just a child when Johnson was there. I remember Nixon, I remember all of that. And as time was going on, I, it, it just came to me more and more and more. So you come to the right organically, the left constantly cultivating, constantly cultivating. Go ahead. Sure, and you make, and what you're describing is a description of political right Evolution, right? I, I think. Uh, you, yeah, you it's saw, an evolution, right? Right. You you saw this big time in um, in the Brexit vote in the UK. As a lot of people said, like, well, you know, it's too bad that we had this Brexit vote now because uh, you know all the people who voted for Leave were old people, and if we had just waited until they died off, if you look at the young. You know, this is the leftist speaking who wanted to stay in the EU, which is amazing because they're talking about... I think I remember this. Go right. ahead, yeah. And so it's like, oh yeah, the young people and, you know, young people voted overwhelmingly to stay and old people voted overwhelmingly to leave, so at least it's a sign that, you know, that uh, we're becoming a more enlightened, connected world and young people understand that. No, those young people will grow old as well. And newsflash, if you hold that same vote in 60 years, all those young people who, or, you know, 40 yeah, years, they're say, this is they're, they're oh, also gonna, they would also be voting leave. But they're not voting leave because they're old people, they're, well, they're not voting leave because they were born within a specific generation that was like the, hey guys, let's vote leave generation. They're voting leave because they're old and wizened. They, they right. know what's going on. Now, that's when right. you talk about cu the cultural right, that's the political right. That's the, can we make good decisions about what political unions we want to belong in, or where taxes should be, or how laws should be enforced. The cultural right is something else. The cultural right is sort of, are we incensed if you use the wrong words? Are we, um, do we wring our hands over buzzwords like homophobia? Or are we, you know, are we culturally healthy and recognize that, you know, it's not nice to hate anybody because of who they are, but it's also maybe not healthy to, uh, you know, to, to tell people that their weird sexual perversions are just a hunky-dory and normal, right? That, that's the cultural right. And the cultural right is ascendant, I believe, because we reproduce and the cultural left does not. Why do you think the cultural left is so obsessed with uh, feticide and preserving feticide as as a legal right. You know, any woman in Massachusetts, any pregnant mother in Massachusetts, could um, legally hire somebody to murder her unborn baby, 
And Beacon Hill does nothing about this. That's true. And my opponent has never done anything to stop this. Right? He preens and, and pretends to be this great, you know, this great, really concerned guy. And he's never done anything to protect those people. He's never done anything to protect those people who are getting killed. Every year, little unborn babies get murdered in this commonwealth. And we've never done anything about it. Why do you think the left protects that? Because they, you know, they would rather see healthy, normal people kill their own progeny than reproduce. Healthy, normal people are a threat to them. They're a threat to their cultural hegemony. And that's true. A lot of my supporters. Very accurate. Right. Where do I see? You know, every. I mean, if I want to go to a, like a, a big mass, you know, Ted Busick supporter meetup, you know, if I want to see all my supporters in one big room, at, you know, at the at, at the same time, I do that every week when I go to mass on Sunday, that's right? True. And so then I'm seeing people like you know, there's this guy. Uh, I won't say his name because I want to. You know, I don't want, I want you know, nasty people contacting him. But there's this guy, he's a huge supporter of mine. I see him at Mass when I go to Mass in Littleton. Um, I love the guy, you know, he walks up to me and shakes my hand and, uh, you know, big smile. Guy has six children. I go to the, I go to the, you know, I try to go to Mass at different Masses in the district, right? So I go to Mass in, I go to Mass in Shirley at uh, St. Anthony of Padua. I go to Mass in Littleton at St. Anne. I go to Mass in Harvard at uh, St. Anne's House, which is a nunnery. Go to St. Anne's House, mm -hmm. by the way, and um, you will see a room packed, a chapel packed with children uh, who vastly outnumber their parents. Because what, 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 what happens? That's the future Practic generation practicing, of, of, yeah. that, of that conservative yeah. movement. Practicing right? Catholics have five, six, seven children, eight, nine, ten children. If you if you float that by one of these like she she leftists who uh, you know mom drives a Prius and dad drives a caravan and you know, whatever and you know they have uh, you know they have like 1.8 children and they live in uh, you know they live in an effete suburb like Acton. No offense, Acton. Please please vote for me. Um, they, they would be you know their their eyebrows would would float off their heads if you told them like well yeah I go to mass with people who have eight kids because they don't. Right, um, but those are the people. They immediately look at the environmental impact, right. the population. Well, yeah, what impact. is the carbon footprint of having that many children? Hmm. Um, but yeah, those are the, those people. The kind of people I see in mass, the kind of people I interact with, the people who are coming and helping out in the campaign. Guys like my stellar, amazing, brilliant, uh, very debonair and good-looking campaign manager. <laughs> these are the people who are. They're in the cultural right. They're not incensed if you use vulgar language. They're incensed that you know a woman would kill her own baby. I, you know, they're not incensed. Uh, they're not incensed if you express um, you know an opinion that uh, hurts somebody's feelings. They're incensed that uh, somebody would um, you know that somebody would uh, try to get a six-year-old or seven-year-old child. To transition into another gender because they sure. think that that's the chic. Yeah, well, getting, thing getting to back do. to what I said, Hillary Clinton uh, is on record uh, on video as actually saying that the unborn have no constitutional rights. Yeah. And and getting back to what I said about the left constantly has to cultivate. This is what has to happen with the LGBT community because think about it, they're all gay. They're not going to reproduce. They're not going to naturally have children unless. Unless their gay friend donates sperm or whatever, but that's a that's a rare thing. That's kind of something that they it, it's it doesn't happen organically the way like Ted was saying. You know, with Catholics, they have six, seven, twelve kids, or or any normal heterosexual couple. They decide, well, all right, we're going to have three kids. Well, I've got three kids. We're going to have four, or we're going to have two. That's something they do organically. The LGBT community constantly has to cultivate, which is why do you think? that they're so hell-bent on getting into our schools and trying to make young people be more sensitive to their own proclivities. Right. Because they need to cultivate that next younger generation and to come up through the ranks to be gay people. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's almost like a cult inculcation that they're trying to impose on people. Right, and even there, I know I can say from, from personal experience that this is not working because I can I have at least two supporters that I know of who are homosexuals, and guess what? They're they're music supporters, so that that's not working. But and that's what's strange about it. Isn't it? That's something the left can't understand. They they can't understand like when they see black supporters for Trump or female supporters or Latino supporters for Trump right. or or just gay, gay people who are working for you or or even again for a Republican, they, they can't stand that. 
They right. can't even fathom that concept. But think about how incredibly callous and uh, cynical and nasty it is that you know you're giving uh, a kindergartner, you know, Heather has two mommies, or you know, King and King, or some, you know, some. You're giving little tiny children uh, propaganda to promote. Uh, unhealthy sexual behavior. Yeah, six-year-old just wants to color. Exactly. You know, leave them alone. You know, forward-thinking communities and, and countries around the world are cracking down on this. In Russia, um, they just passed a law prohibiting propagandizing homosexuality to children. What you know, what what's happened in the world where Russia is, uh, you know, is culturally um, leading the leading the United States, you know, showing the way for the U.S. You know, we we used to be. We used to be the people who, who were sort of the, 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 the beacon to the world of, of, of enlightenment and advancement and progress. Yeah. Now it's Russia? Yeah. Well, oh, well, when did we, we see that role? If homosexuality is supposed to be natural and you're quote unquote born that way, why do you have to legislate it? Why do you have to promote it? Why do you have to put it into language? Why does it have to be promoted in schools? If it's a natural thing that's going to occur anyway, let it just occur naturally. Well, here's the other thing is, does it ever occur to these people that there are a lot of normal, or let's say otherwise normal people with, you know, different or unusual sexual proclivities, maybe they're homosexual or whatever, who just want to be left alone and don't want to be tagged in their, like, weird, global battle for cultural hegemony. You know, I think the reason why I have a couple of homosexual supporters, if I can, if I can stick my neck out a little bit, is um, what did they get out of a guy like Jamie Eldridge saying, well, yeah, because of the LGBTQ community, now you have to lose the right to segregate your bathrooms on the basis of sex if you're a business owner. You know, if I'm a business owner and I run a bar or a restaurant, suddenly I'm being told by Beacon Hill, hey, you're not allowed to, uh, you're not allowed to have a, a, a bathroom just for women and a bathroom just for men. You're not allowed to do that. And then, um, by the way, our rationale for that is LGBTQ people. Those people asked us to do this. They asked us to take your rights away. They asked us to take away your rights as a business owner. Or, you know, one of the, I spoke at a rally and an old woman came up to me afterwards and told me that every time she goes into a bathroom um, in a public place, her husband goes in with her. Her, her husband goes into the bathroom with her. And, it's legal now. Well, because her husband doesn't want to take the risk that some other guy is going to go in there and do something bad to her, so he just escorts her right, right to the stall. I don't think that that is progress. So I think that there's a lot of people who maybe their, you know, their sexual proclivities are outside of the norm, but who cares? That's what they do in their bedroom. Why do we, you know, I, trust me, normal people don't care and, about and, what right. they do. And that's right. the conservative right. side. And those, like, and those people It's your are, private business, your own private home, it's your business. It's right. none of my business. And it's none of the rest of the state's business. Exactly. It's none of the rest of the people's business. And those people are saying, those people are saying, you're policing other people's language in my name. You're taking away other people's, you're taking away the rights of business owners in my name. You're introducing totally age inappropriate, uh, you know, and educational yeah, material. Yeah, educational material to children in my name. And I think the reason why they support a guy like me is because they say, they're, they're, they want to say to the left, stop doing that. You're not making things better for me. You're putting me in hot water. Look, you and I are... really are. Right. Getting back, hang on. Getting back to what you said about, you know, making a bar, having to do this. Well, let's say two gay guys or two gay women go out to a bar. Not necessarily a gay bar. They just go out. Like a place around here. They want to go and have dinner. Right. Uh, re regardless of whether you're a gay man or a gay woman, it doesn't matter. When, uh, excuse me, I gotta use I gotta use the ladies' room. I gotta use the men's room. You, you're still a man and you're still a woman, okay? And now I want to just use the, the the bathroom that I want to use. Whereas if you have, I'm gonna say, let's say they put a separate bathroom in, where it's like the other bathroom. Then you go in there. Now people are turning their heads. Oh, there's there's one of those. Look at Lee's going into the East right, yeah. Cave. That's, that's, what, that's, what, that's what Ted's saying there. It's like, stop doing this. You're, you're just making life difficult for me. I just want to be left alone, be in the privacy of my own relationship with my own person, exactly. and go out and just be able to enjoy the world like anybody else does. Yeah. And that's the thing about and that's the thing about equality. Not that I want to be treated special or different because I'm X, Y, or Z. Right. I want to be I want to be equal just like everybody else. Right. Yeah. No, that's that's exactly what it is. It's you know um, we the the 
democratic concept of diversity, which you know you have to accept at the outset their unfalsifiable platitudes about diversity being a strength or diversity is really good for us. I've never seen any real evidence for that, and it's and the things that they cite for evidence of that are so ephemeral or intangible that you couldn't really argue against it anyway. Um, but their concept of diversity isn't people being able to do their own thing and be left alone. Sure. And if it you, has to be, you, again, it has right. to be cultivated and manufactured. Yeah, if you open that up, of course, if you say, look, everybody can do their own thing and we'll leave you alone, then you're going to have people doing all this kinds of stuff. This is why understanding the history of the United States is so important, is, is, that, is that even back in, in, in when there was segregation and discrimination, you there are millions of stories in the United States of different people from different ethnicities and different uh, sexual backgrounds and everything making amazing strides right. in, in society, in the military, and just making their mark on history. But here's the thing, here's the thing that, that always struck me. When you hear about somebody in the past who did something amazing, something extraordinary, no mention of the fact that they, well, maybe if they were black, okay, that's something. Or maybe if they were Chinese or Japanese or Latino or something, maybe that would be mentioned. But here's the important thing I want to make. If there is somebody who did something amazing in the past who happened to be homosexual, that wouldn't be mentioned. Now, the LGBT community would say, well, see, that's what we're talking about. No, that's, that's not what we're talking about. Because now you're taking away from that amazing accomplishment that that person did at that time. All you're concentrating on to begin with is, wow, look at this amazing thing this person did. But the LGBT community wants to say, oh, did you know that he was gay? Who the fuck cares? You just took away from the amazing thing this person did in 1920 or 1890 or 1940. I see what you're saying. You can pull that out of history, I think, right into the present. Look, there are a lot of people who don't want to be defined by their skin color <laughs> it's a label. or their sexual proclivity. It's the modern version that the Democrats use of segregation. Yeah. I'll put labels on people. Yeah, because they'd rather be defined by their merits. Whatever happened to being defined by your merits, not by what's, you know, not by what's, um, intrinsic to how you were born, like your skin color, or what's a little bit weird about you but should be private, like your sexual activities, but what are your merits? What merits do you have? What have you created? What have you achieved? Whose lives have you affected in a positive way? Who loves you? Who do you love? Right? Not, um, well, what, what, what sort of weird sexual things are you into? Yeah, exactly, right, right, exactly. Right? That's, and I've said that too in the past too, it's like, really, do you want to know about my little proclivity? Exactly. Me. No, trust me, we don't. No, we don't. No, yeah. we don't. I mean, listen, if I, yeah, if somebody got mad at me, um, right, uh... He what involves it, you, a bunny suit. Right. <laughs> <laughs> involves a bunny suit. I'm yeah. No, I like to dress up as Godzilla, and, uh, you know, my significant other dresses up as Tokyo, and then, no, um... <laughs> I'm sorry, I just got, when you said soup, but I just went off. But it's true, um, it's like really, why do we need to know this shit? Like, no, yeah, I got, I got in trouble, uh, I said to you that I've had you know, a number of controversies already because of the things I say. One of the things that I got in trouble for was, I, re I talked about this transgender bathroom bill, and I said, I, I referred to these men, who want to go into the women's bathroom. That that's what they're standing on, is they're standing on their right to enter a woman's bathroom, to violate the privacy of a lady.